Welcome to the Survival Prepper Show, where being labeled a crazy prepper is a badge of honor. Learn about disaster preparedness, survival, and get ready for whatever challenges might come your way. This is not your typical prepping podcast, and they won't be silenced by the censors. Here are your hosts, Duff and Dale. Hey there, everyone. Welcome to the show this week. Uh, this week, we are, with, first off, I suppose, happy Easter to everyone. Uh, this week, we're doing a pre-recorded show because I've got some stuff going on uh, this Sunday, and I'm sure uh, quite a few of you have stuff going on as well, or maybe it's uh, uh, already done, but uh, for, happy Easter. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about uh, a lot of kind of the, the preparedness fundamentals, uh, family planning, uh, communications, all of that, I suppose, kind of basic stuff, but it's that really important stuff. I mean, we think about food storage and water storage and all that stuff all the time, but uh, we need to make sure that we can get when when something does happen that we have our family on board, or at least they're they know what's going on, uh, or you know, you can kind of hope that they do the right things and you can give them the tools to do that stuff. So, uh, and then towards the end, we're towards the end, we're going to talk about. Um, would you turn them away? And I want to talk about, because I think this is kind of a uh, a personal choice, I suppose, and it really depends on the person. But I always think it's a fascinating subject of if somebody does come to your door, what does it take to turn them away? So yeah, that's a good conversation to have on Easter, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah no kidding. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, that's, you know, all the people, ah, I want anybody let me in, you know, happy Easter. Oh yeah. 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 I see how it works. Yeah. 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 <laughs> But just having the the prepping conversation to begin with on Easter kind of <laughs> just seems kind of weird, but but we're doing it. So, but uh, at any rate, I suppose what we'll do is we'll start with this. I've got we've we've done so many Mind for Survival articles lately that I've got three from Survivalist Prepper this week that we're going to go over. Nice, yeah. So uh, let me uh, go ahead and sh- and start with this first article here about communications and disaster planning. And this one, you know, I think all of this stuff is is really important when it comes to preparedness because this is that stuff that, you know, we can have, like I said, we can have the food storage, we can have the water storage, we can have all of this stuff. But if things aren't falling into place beforehand, um, you know, they, they're kind of, you're going to be running around in circles trying to get this stuff figured out. So if you have that plan, if you know or if you're, you know, if you've got teenagers and and they kind of know what to expect with all of this stuff, then you're going to have a better shot at maybe if everybody's, you know, in different spots and all of that, you can get everybody rounded up uh, and you know that, or you have a better, I, I guess, more confidence knowing that uh, they're going to do the things that they're supposed to be doing, right? Yeah, I think, uh, I think having... Uh, communications and, and a good disaster plan. I, th- I think people need that nowadays, man, you know, um, especially the communications part that you talk about, you know, in there it's, if, if you don't have the ability, you know, we talk about these big, these events, right. Where, you know, that, that possibly this event that happens right away. Right. And so at some point the event's going to get, uh, may get to the point where you don't have communications with your family members. So what's your plan? Right. What have you told them where if you lose communications, what does everybody do? Yeah. You know, or what are some alter all, you know, alternative ways of getting in touch with one another? Yeah. Does everything have you looked? Does everything you rely on to get a hold of family members rely on cell networks? You know, even if you have a hard line, how how is that working? Or you have a phone that you think is a hard line. How is that phone working? You know, make sure double check that so that way you can have different. Uh, ways of getting hold of people you know you don't see too many uh, phone booths anymore out and about but uh, come up with some ways to try to either get people in touch with one another or tell people what to do if they lose touch with one another like hey if you can't get a hold of mom and dad here's what you do yeah right and and think about the situations that would cause them not to be able to get a hold of mom and dad Does mom and dad can't answer the phone because they're you know tied up or something's happened to them Or can they not answer the phone because the cell networks are down? What do they do? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, With this, in this article, I've got 
when you're when you're thinking about disaster communications, this is not the you know ham radio talking to you know grandma from three counties away or something like that. This is more about how are you going to communicate with your family members. Uh, you know, not necessarily if it's some sort of Mad Max thing, but just like something just mm -hmm. initially happened. So um, in here, I've got who are you communicating with? Um, your inner circle, this is your immediate family, probably lives in your house. If something happens and you've got kids at school, uh, you've got people that are in different places, um, how how are you going to communicate with them? Like you just talked about the, the alternatives to phones, because there are some situations where those, you know, the cell towers won't be affected. So maybe that is an option. But what options do you have if they're not? Um, and then also in your communication plan, what where are you going to... Where, um, what are you going to do when you, what are you going to communicate when you can actually communicate in person? Um, so, and that's part of having that plan there of saying, okay, I need to get everybody together. And then we're going to talk, we're going to put all this, you know, part two of the plan in place. Um, and then think about what information is going to need to be communicated. And this is where, as you're thinking about these different disaster scenarios, what's likely in your area? Is it tornadoes? Is it hurricanes? Is it earthquakes? Is it, you know, what, what are those likely situations? Um, and what information is going to be needed to, to be communicated in those situations? Say, like I said, say your kids at school, your wife's at work, you're at work and, or husband, uh, wife or husband's at work and you're, you're at work and you've got to figure out, um, how to get to that point where you're going to communicate in person. And that can be pretty tough sometimes. Uh, if you've got cell phones and all of that stuff, you know, maybe, maybe that's possible, but if it's not, I've thought about, um, uh, you know, in Lisa's car, uh, she's got a ham radio. She doesn't know how to use ham radio that much and ham radio. Even though I said in the beginning, I'm not going to be talking about ham radio, but this isn't long distances. This is, say the cell phone towers are out. She's a couple miles away. If it's possible with line of sight to get a signal across um, where we can communicate with each other, then having that option um, is, is a good option to have. Now, in her car, I've got to let her know what frequency uh, that I'm going to be on uh, and let her know that, you know, it's not going to work through hills. It's got to be line of sight. Um, so there's, do you give her you know, alternate frequencies? What's that? Do you give her alternate frequencies uh, in case a bunch of people are gabbing on the one you're on? Yeah. I mean, it, it, it really depends on, um, I guess in a situation like that, yeah, probably there's going to be a lot of chatter on I mean, there. It's kind of like that pace plan kind of pace plan plan kind of thing, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. If for whatever reason that first frequency isn't working, people are, it's jammed up something, whatever's going on. What's your, you know, do you have a backup, couple backup plans just in case? Yeah. Well, um, and the way ham radio works go, is know. a lot of the, the heavy, the, the heavy traffic bands are going to be those ones connected to receivers or, uh, uh, yeah. repeaters, because that's right. where people can get their, their signal out further. And that's where a lot of the communication is going to go on. So if you have, um, just some, some band that is just kind of off there, you know, the odds are a lot better that that's going to be useful. But I mean, think my, my whole point with this is just think about those things, those alternatives to the, the cell phone stuff. If you don't have any alternatives, that's, you need to have a plan in place beforehand saying, okay, if we are separated, you're at work, I'm at work and we need to get home. This is the route I'm going to take. And you need to stick to that route or this is, you know, this is how long it what should if you take can't me. stick to that route? What's that? What if you can't stick to that route? Uh, <laughs> then, then, you know what? Communicate plan B and plan C. This is where all that communication is important. Uh, maybe sitting down and having that yeah, conversation well, so like I, we I think are. One of, the, one of the things that to help that out is to actually practice this stuff and practice the talk, the, the speaking, the communicating part of it. Just not having the plan, right? Because I think where it goes wrong with people sometimes like, so if there's some major disaster in your area and like everybody like experiences some part of it, right? So everybody's going to have their story and they're all going to be excited to talk about. It. So when, when the communication starts happening and there's like, Hey, there's certain things when, you know, if things are bad or, you know, disaster level bad that you need to communicate, you know, like, Hey, we're all okay. We're staying put this kind of stuff. But I think what, what a lot of people tend to do is like, Hey, here's the plan that we're going to communicate. And when they communicate, it's, like you yeah. know oh my god the pictures on the wall did this and this and that happened and it's you know and that's great if everybody's okay right but i think early on you want to it was like 
when with our guard, the guard force overseas, right? If, if we would get hit, all everybody would give their their ups, right? They get on the radio and, you know, everybody would radio their team leader. The team leaders would radio into the talk and we'd get an ability if everybody was okay. I think you, like initially that, that when you have a disaster, it's something to think about, like, Hey, what are we going to communicate and how are we going to communicate that? Like, Hey everybody, when you, you know, you're going to be excited. And when that, you have that phone call, when you get a hold of somebody, just say, you know, to start with, we're okay. Are you okay? Yeah. Yeah. And, and take like a level headed approach to it and then, okay, well, what, what is the problem? Not what happened? What is, what is literally the problem at the moment? Like, you know, you know, you can talk about the, all the craziness of it, but you know, Bob had a chunk of concrete fall on his head. Okay. And then, then start figuring things out from there. And, and so kind of have those conversations. And then about when you're when, on the route plan is um, you should always have that just like communications as a pace plan. So does route planning. You know, when we were driving around Baghdad for years, I, I was the tactical commander. I, I guided the motorcades through the streets and you would, uh, I'd have my laptop up and every route we went everywhere, part of the, every part of the route we were on, we had uh, ulterior routes we could get off on. Right. And usually it was, we usually had three different routes all the way across our, to wherever we were going, because if you get jammed up on one, you have to move to the other. And then it's, how do you communicate that? Just like you said, you know, you told Lisa, it's like, Hey, um, and, and you don't have to have the conversations of like, well, we need, this is my primary route. This is our primary route. And you don't have to get all technical, whatever, com whatever that, that conversation is, or what are those words, that lingo that works for you and, you know, Lisa or, you know, other people in their families have that real succinct, Hey, I'm going to my, you know, I'm, I'm going over on to whatever the street is, the next street over that you, you, you'd planned on, or I'm doing this, I'm taking my secondary route. You know, you're taking your, or, or there, maybe they're colored routes. You can use colors, right? I'm, you know, blue, red, white, and blue, whatever you guys work out, have something so you can say real quickly and succinctly, this is what I'm doing. Yeah. And, and have those conversations and, and commute because communication is huge in a, in an emergency without good and effective communications. It turns into a total train wreck. Yeah. Or it can. Um, a, a couple of things that you just kind of brought to my mind, uh, and then we'll move on to what to include in your plan. But when you're thinking about that stuff too, you, when you're, if you have kids or somebody that's not really interested in preparedness and all that, they need to know what to communicate, especially when you think about teenagers, um, they just, they start freaking out. They, you know, they, they're thinking the stuff that's important to them is not the stuff that's important to you. So you need to make sure they know what to communicate. And also you were just talking about those routes, have those, those areas in between that are pit stops and communicate what those are. So if there is something that happens where they just can't get back, if you find yourself yeah. having to go out and look or, or search for them, you, you know, the, the, the place they're going to be or, or the high likelihood of the places they're going to be. If they well, have to and, and, down. and I think you, you, you pre-plan that, right? Yeah. You say, Hey, if you're, we used to say like, if you're beyond this phase line, in other words, if you're beyond a certain point on your route to go somewhere beyond that point, this is where everybody will go. If we have a problem now, like in, in Iraq and other places, that was like an American base, you know, or an embassy compound or something somewhere. Right. So like you didn't have any choice really, but to go anywhere else. Cause like, it just didn't work out that well. So, but you set those, those like rally points up along the way, right? You set, you set these points up. So you go, Hey, if this happens, if so, they have a problem here, this is where they're going and we'll meet them. Yeah. That way, if you don't have communications, you know, again, like we talk about cell networks down all that, you know, okay, these are the three places I'm going to drive to go pick up my kids. If they were out, because I, this is where we have decided that they will go to be safe and, and hunker down until I can come and get them. Like, because if, if you don't know that, if you don't know it as, you know, the person in charge of stuff, then they, they sure don't know it. And even if they do, you're not on the same page. So they're going to go somewhere and, you know, you, you have to pre-coordinate and practice that practice, like what you call it and make it, I don't know, figure out a way to make it fun. Yeah. 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 Kind of like a fire drill. I mean, that's, it's pretty basic, but you don't have to, you know, have this conversation, especially with your kids or, or spouse that isn't on board with prepping like you are, um, it, it, you know, mm -hmm. talk about it to that level of, you know, this is just the, the, the rational stuff that we need to think about and we need to do. And at least, 
you know, then you can have that conversation and, and cross your fingers that they're going to do the right things when the time comes basically. Yeah. Well, and the other things you can do too, man, is so like, like with, like, for example, with Lisa or anybody with your a family member or friend or your, yourself is like when you're on your route to and from work or to and from school, wherever the places you go a bunch are to and from the market, you know, you, you have, okay, if this street's clogged up, you have this other way to go. Well, when you're doing, when you're driving around town, actually think about that. Or, you know, I, like, I, I'm sure Lisa has a, a fairly, you know, hat was it 45 minute drive to get to work, something like that. Yeah. Close. Half hour. I mean, she, she's driving, you know, a good ways. Well, Hey, okay. If this road's down, here's what I'm going to do. And not just think about it, go drive or go take the time. And, you know, gas prices are through the roof. Maybe not, but <laughs> as much go take the time to drive that other route. So you do that a few times, you know, because when you drive home from work, you know, when you drive home from work and you get that point where you don't even remember driving home and you drove home on just like autopilot, like, you know, that route so well, you weren't even in this universe and you still made it home. Yeah. Right. Get to the point where you can do that. So that way, if something happens, like you have familiarity with everything around there. Maybe when you're on that, that other route, that secondary route, you go, what if something happens here? I'm going to turn down in this neighborhood. Next thing you know, like, oh, there, this is a cul-de-sac, not a good street to turn down. Yeah. You know, get, get really intimate, intimately familiar with your, with your, the areas where you drive and stuff and you have to do it all the time, but over time you do it, you know, you do it often enough you'll have a good idea of all the whole lay of the land to get to wherever you're going. Yeah. Same thing. If you have a vacation home or a bug out location, a friend's house, you're going to go to if stuff happens, do the same thing. When you go there, take different routes, figure it out over time. Use your, use the time you have to your advantage. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's funny how you say that, how driving to work, driving to the store, all that stuff becomes kind of subconscious. How many of us have been driving to workers or, or to the store or something and taking a wrong turn because your brain was basically on autopilot and you were driving to work. So you're like, what the hell am I turning here? Oh yeah. It, it's very interesting. Yeah. And, and when you drive those new routes, don't go on autopilot. Tell yourself, I'm going to pay attention. Like yeah. treat it like, Hey, I'm actually driving around this because uh, there's a problem because when the problem happens, you need an answer to it right now. We were coming back from one place in Iraq when I was doing, uh, you know, the, the, Department of State stuff, the protection for Department of State. And we're rolling up on this intersection and just stuff looked weird. And all of a sudden I realized what looked weird. There were car parts and a bunch of burned out cars. They just had a V-bid go off. It's like, oh, probably need to go a different, go somewhere else right now because that's a really bad place to be in. Yeah. And so we were able to like, okay, this is where we're going. And we had planned it where you sit down and you look over your maps, you do mission briefs, and you're able to box around and get get to, get away from that problem real quick. You know, are you gonna have that in Colorado or wherever? Maybe no. And then, I don't know, like, I didn't think, I imagine a bunch of people in Iraq didn't think they're going to have car bombs going off in the middle of their city uh, yeah. for decades, you know? So never say never. Yep. Yep. Never, we're never going to have a pandemic in our lifetime. Never yeah. have a, never have hyperinflation. Never going to have another one anyway. <laughs> All right. So yeah, I right? want to uh, move on to what to include in your disaster plan. And this one, we don't have to spend a lot of time on this, but this is more for those people that are you know not on board like like we were talking about earlier not on board as much as you are but it's all important stuff to have phone numbers um and i have in here phone numbers not contacts uh, because these days i don't know i mean i know lisa's phone number that's probably about it because you don't ever ha you don't have to remember phone numbers anymore i remember when we were teenagers and growing up and stuff it was basically uh, you had like your wallet full of different phone numbers and all that stuff or the well, little let me ask you this. Do, you, do you know Lisa's phone number because you knew her phone number before cell phones became so such that they are now with contacts where it's just like oh hey you know hit hit a button and now you got someone's a contact and you you know you don't ever really ever get to know their number no, I think it's more so, I think it's more so because on bills and passwords and, and accounts and stuff like that, oh, um, they ask right. for that information. So it's just one of those things that, um, that's the only number basically that I've actually had to use and, uh, for different things, uh, paying the phone bill, you know, all of that stuff. Um, I think that's why, but even paying the phone bill, I, I we've got one kid that's still on our phone plan. I, <laughs> I don't know their number. Um, so, um. Uh, um, an emergency contact you, you can get, uh, in this, I've got along with the important phone. phone numbers of family and friends. 
Uh, make sure you include any of the emergency service phone numbers, uh, the fire department, the police department, the, the hospitals in your area, all of those places that you may need to check if you can't, you know, get a hold of, of somebody in your family. Uh, the next one on here, and you, you kind of already went over this quite a bit was the escape routes. Uh, you think about though, and we, we talked about, you know, having a place in the middle or, or your, your, your locations where you're going to stop and hide out. But, uh, what, what is the escape route is not necessarily from your home to somewhere, but maybe from work to your home, from, or to your home, from school to your home or wherever you are, we don't get to pick when, you know, does that disaster strikes, we got to figure that stuff out. So, um, and then the, uh, and I guess we kind of talked about this as well, the emergency meeting spots, uh, figuring out where you're going to meet, say it is someplace, uh, maybe home isn't accessible. So what, what is that secondary place that you're going to go to? Uh, it could be friend and family's homes. It could be an abandoned barn out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, just that place where you're going to meet up and then figure out your plan. You have any thoughts on those before I uh, just ramble through this whole list? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, you can get like little tiny phone books still, right? That fit in a wallet. Um, you easily obviously fit in a purse, get something like that and put down your important numbers in there, write them down by, by hand and carry that with you, man. Cause you don't remember that stuff anymore. And you know, you, you, it's not even that we have to worry about EMP. Your phone falls in a puddle and it gets fried. Okay. Well now what are you going to do? Yeah. Right. So ha have that with you. So that way maybe, maybe you have to use somebody else's phone to get in contact with somebody. Well, they don't have your numbers. Most likely if some stranger, right, you have your numbers. So yeah. have them with you if you can. And, and I say that not carrying a bunch of phone numbers with me. It's something I need to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, family photos is, is another one as well. And I saw something the other day on, I, I forget where I saw it, but it was basically a, a woman in Ukraine that had written on her child's back all the important information uh, about uh, her name, date of birth, all of that stuff. Because I mean, it's it's terribly sad, but it makes a lot oh. of sense. If something if something happened to the mother or the father, somebody's got to know that information about that kid. I'm not saying oh, yeah. you need to do that I, here. <laughs> well, I mean, I have um, on my right side, I have a tattoo that's underneath, like up under by my uh, just below my armpit. That's my name and social security number and information. Yeah. Yeah. Because you know, it's like, I was always kind of like, well, if I get, you know, if I, if I get my head chopped off somewhere, hopefully they can at least get, you know, they figure it out by, Hey, here's a piece of it. And it was under the arm. So that way, if it's a blast or something like that, it doesn't, they call them meat tags. Um, it doesn't like uh, cook your skin. So it, it will most likely weather the storm. So unless they, you know, peel it off you or something like that, at least they can kind of figure out who you are later on. Yeah. Interesting. Um, but you know, family photos and stuff, I was kind of, this is where I was going with all that. And it kind of the same <laughs> type of thing, but, um, if, you know, if, if you, somebody runs across one of your children, they, they need to be able to know who you are and all of that stuff. So it's just all that stuff that may be important to have, um, uh, something, you know, even if it's just photocopied, something you, they put in, you put in your kid's trunk, stuff like that. So, um, just yeah. all that little stuff you don't, you don't think about a, a lot. Um, with this, I've also got emergency binders and stuff, and we're going to talk about that in, in depth uh, here in a little bit. But I wanted to move on to the basics of bug out bags. And this is one of those things in prepper circles. You can get 1,500, you can find 1,500 different articles on it in, in you know, just by searching the internet. Now, we're not going to go into a lot of depth on this because it, this is it, what, when I'm talking about this stuff with family planning and all that stuff, I'm not talking about the super, you know, super stacked out bug out bag or anything like that. This is just the basic thing for that, that person that doesn't know a lot about preparedness, right? So you, you want to make sure they have a few days worth of water in their bug out bags. Uh, a lot of people don't carry, some people don't even carry any water. But like I said, this is for that person that doesn't know a lot about preparedness. And I think having that, th that three days worth of water is important. Even if it's not like three gallons of water, I think it's important to have enough water that's going gonna, gonna to last you a few days and not leave you completely dehydrated. For the person that doesn't know a lot about preparedness, I think that's important. Uh, the food, same thing. Uh, the ration bars, the lightweight stuff, the stuff that's going to last forever. Clothing, footwear, socks. I'll, I'll run through this list and I'll let you expand on it. But 
um, sleeping bags, blankets, first aid supplies, even if it's just a little tiny kit. Uh, and then I've got in this article, which I'll link to below, but um, emergency supplies, so your basic bug out bag supplies. You don't need to worry about feral rods and stuff like that, I don't think, because they're not going to know how to use or they may not know how to use that stuff. But a Bic lighter is pretty important. Uh, and then personal hygiene products. Again, that's that's your kind of choice as far as I don't think that uh, brushing your teeth is going to be super important, but it may be to some people. Feminine hygiene products may be something that's that's important. Uh, and then extra cash and small bills, because if the grid's down and stuff like that, uh, and make sure, like I said in this article, if you if you if you put doing it for your kids, make sure they don't know where the money is because it'll be gone. But um, just that basic stuff that you can throw something in your your kid's trunk, in your wife or husband's trunk, uh, something they don't have to th put a whole lot of thought into, but it's going to have that stuff that when they if that situation ever does come up, they're going to be super happy <laughs> that um they have that stuff in their trunk so you have do you want to expand on any of those no nah, i mean i think you pretty much nailed it i mean that's the if you don't have it with you it's not going to do you any good when you need it right so yeah yeah you know and it's i mean i know as preppers it, it can seem like we can go overboard you know i got the back seat of my truck filled up with a bunch of stuff i take it on the road i you know uh, on, on road trips and stuff so i have I got, I have my full bug out bag or whatever you want to call it. I guess it depends on where you're at, right? If I'm in my truck, I'm not bugging out. I'm getting home. I don't know. It's one of those bags full of a bunch of crap, um, boots, socks, water, uh, like a, you know, freeze dried food. Um, rather have it and not need it than, you know, I mean, it's not like I have that space full or anything like that. Yeah. Dog can lay on top of it a little bit, but yeah, I think, you, I think you need that, man. I, I too many people. And you don't have to have a full bug out bag either. If that's not, not your jam, you don't have the space, you know, get one of those little messenger bags or something, put some stuff in it. Yeah. Just, just in case it's, it, it's always a good idea. I mean, I remember when I lived in DC, they'd get a half an inch or of snow, you know, and would, and it would ice up the freeways and, and they weren't ready for it out there half the time. And so people would just park their cars on the freeways. They would just leave their cars and walk and take off walking. I'll have some stuff. Yeah. And, and this kind of goes to the whole preparing for the unprepared thing, that conversation we have from time to time about how much are you willing to do for other people. And I think if you're talking about immediate family members or family members you care a lot about or close with, and they just are not buying into the whole preparedness thing, I think stuff like this is, is the bare minimum you can do to kind of help them. We've talked about in the past how we put first aid kits and stuff like that in our kids' cars when they lived here. Stick them in the trunk uh, and they don't even have to worry about it, but we know it's there when the time comes. They know it's there when the time comes. And same thing with like bug out bags and stuff like that. You get those those bare essentials and it's going to be better than nothing at all. So, Yeah. Well, and I think it's like, you know, everybody wants to help one another out. So if someone's not into preparedness, there's a way – that they want to do something for you if they're, you know, if they're a friend and someone that cares about you, just like you, maybe they're just, maybe they're not on board with, with preparedness. Right. So, you know, Hey, let me do this for you. It makes me feel better in case something ever happens. You have it. Let me know if you use it so I can make sure you get it replaced. And then in turn, who knows, whatever, no, whatever their jam is, maybe that helps you out. Maybe they can build something. I don't know, whatever, you know, whatever that is. So don't, I think a lot, I think a lot of times we can shut down other people because they're not into preparedness. Yeah, not everybody needs to be a crazy prepper, you know. Yeah, like, just do it for them. If if they're that important for you, do it for them and tell them, hey, this makes me feel good. It makes me feel better. Uh, just let me do this for you. Yeah, you, you you never know. Maybe they they get bored at at one point or another. They go through it and they have questions about things, and it and it opens up that conversation about why why you're that crazy prepper. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. um. All right. So what I want to do, I want to pivot now to talking about emergency binders, because that was on that list with creating a good preparedness plan. And I think this is one that I think is really important. And it's one that doesn't get, I guess, the credit it deserves a lot of time. I think a, a lot of people probably do have these emergency binders, but there's a lot of people that that don't or it's disorganized and stuff like that. Um, I put together hours a while back and I wanted to go through some of the things that that I've done. Um, and a lot of it is just kind of how you feel about this stuff. Um, in this article I've got here, I talked about how, uh, and this is a podcast Lisa and I did a while back too. Uh, I talked about how it's two different 
binders. You've got an emergency procedures binder, and then you've got an important information binder. And I think the emergency procedures binder, uh, that's more of a, a kind of a three ring binder that you just keep continuing to add stuff in and add stuff in. Uh, in that binder, it should have a list of where all the important supplies are. Uh, like we've talked about before, lights out kit, the gas shut off valve, the breaker box, all that stuff. Uh, the binder is something that they can read whenever they feel like it, something they can reference when the subject comes up. Uh, so if it is, you know, you know, the lights, the, just a basic power outage or something, they can get into the light, that lights out kit and they can read how to start the generator and all that stuff. Um, binders, in my opinion, anyway, like I said, everyone's it, stuff is going to be different, but they should read like a lesson and, and not something they have to sift through and go to page 14 for this. And then, um, wonder, you know, about how, how to do this because it's not in the direction. So it should read like a lesson plan. Uh, like you're walking them through step by step, kind of like a, an instruction manual when you, when you first buy something new, something like that. Uh, and it also should be simple and to the point basically. So uh, any thoughts on the the procedures binder itself, not necessarily the the important documents and stuff, but just procedures for like, again, we talk, we're talking yeah. about those people that maybe aren't that crazy prepper like you are, uh, but may need that well, information. Don't go too, don't go too in, deep into it, right? Like again, make it simple, simple and to the point, make it so they can do it. They don't need necessarily to have this super in-depth background and how everything works and stuff. Remember the situations get, if, if they're going to do the emergency binder, um, unless they're, unless it's when you pull it out and get them to sit down and go over it with them at some point, uh, they're going in there cause they need it most likely. Right. And so it's, it's probably a stressful situation. So have everything very, you know, bullet point, not a lot of real big detail, unless it's super, super necessary. Yeah. Make it super simple for somebody that's, a not into the stuff, you know, be not used to doing the stuff see, and see that they're in the middle of crazy, a uh, bunch of craziness going on. Yeah. Make sure that they're ready for all that by, uh, again, keeping it direct and to the point and, you know, going over it with them. So that way, if you go over it in advance with them, um, even if it's difficult to get them to sit down, you know, have that conversation go, again, this will make me feel good. Can you just sit down and go over it? And, and I'd appreciate your feedback yeah. and then go through it with them. Maybe they see things that you didn't see. And at, at a bare minimum, at least they've read through the plan once with you and had the opportunity. Maybe they ask some questions about it. So it makes the plan take that much more hold in their mind. They at least go, okay, it's, it's not unfamiliar. They, they have an idea, but you got to sit down with them and take their feedback and, and help refine the points based upon that. Yeah. They, depending on the person, they may even enjoy some of the stuff like, like hooking up an inverter to your car uh, to get light or whatever. That may be something that that interests people. It's like, okay, this is how this this is done. Uh, it could be something if you don't practice that stuff, they're scared. They're scared out of their minds to do it because they don't know how to. They, they don't know if they're going to blow themselves up or shock the shit out of themselves with the battery. So doing that stuff and and practicing that with them will um, give them a little bit more confidence about all that stuff. Uh, one other thing we do in those procedures binders is we we put recipes and stuff in there. If there's stuff that we find online that we know if the, the grid's down or whatever, we're not going to have access to. Um, it's it's good to have all of that information in there, even how to do different things in preparedness, how to use a ferro rod. You know, have a, if, if you have an article that's pretty simple about how to use a ferro rod and all that, have that in there. And then have an index of where all of this information is uh, and then continually add to that index as you, as you add to things. This is why I'm talking about three ring binder because – you had a bunch of recipes and and bunch of tutorials and stuff like that. Um, it's going to get pretty thick. Uh, you could also like for yeah. the generator. This is a place where you could also just throw that instruct or that uh, the manual in there. Uh, and granted, a manual is going to be a lot more complicated than like what you were just talking about, or make it simple. Because sometimes trying to find the information you need in a user manual, <laughs> you got to. Yeah. It, it's hard well, to find. The other thing, I mean, I think because we're old fogies, everybody tends to think of lists and binders and, oh, the grid's down. Oh, well, yeah, that's true. So it's a good idea to have a, you know, hard copy. I, I'm always a big fan of that. But nowadays, everybody has old laptops, old iPads, you know, tablets. Most people do. Take one of your old computers, download videos, mm -hmm. you know, clean it up and all that and download some videos or record some videos. You know, I mean, you can go on to YouTube 
and, and figure it out. There's ways you can you, you can download videos, you can screen record, depending on the you can get YouTube memberships, whatever. But do something, and that way, maybe when they're in in a mess, it's like you literally can you talk them through what you're trying to talk them through in the in the binder, right? Like, hey, this is what you're going to do right now. You can take a video, even just take your take your phone out, take a video of you walking through and talking them through how to start the generator, yeah. how to you know do whatever it is that you're talking to a binder about, and and that they, they can open it up and oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Very good you point. Know, put that stuff on a on a flash drive or you know some or or something on an external hard drive. Yeah. So that they can they can take it and load into something and and take that and put it in a Faraday. You can buy Faraday bags on um uh Amazon and stuff. Put in a Faraday bag and do and maybe the Faraday bag doesn't work. I don't know, but maybe it does. Give it a shot. Helps them out. Yeah, it, you might as well <laughs> cuz it's definitely not going to work without the Faraday bag. So <laughs> um, I, I've got a few of those flash drives that I have just, you know, prepping files and survival files. I've even got a couple CDs that have a bunch of old army manuals and stuff like that on it that I need to figure out I, how I'm going to get the information off of there because I don't have anything that plays a CD or that will open up a CD anymore. None of my computers have, have the CD thing on it anymore. So I've got to figure out how I, I can transfer those files onto something useful uh, either that or, or yeah. download them again. But, uh, but yeah, Dude, I mean, I, I'd really look at, I, I'd look at getting one of your old laptops, man. I mean, you know how to work on those a little bit too, right? Cleaning it, cleaning out the memory and stuff. Yeah. And just loading what you need to run the, like these videos and load them on there, you know, maybe find yourself an extra battery, um, throw, you know, throw your external hard drive in there with, uh, you know, movies and some TV shows or whatever, and have that in your, you know, wherever you keep all your stuff and there you go. I mean, if, if, if the world goes to heck, at least you might have, maybe that gets saved and you have something to entertain yourself. You have something to help people, you know, understand what it is they need to do. If you can't tell, sh show them. Yeah. I think, I think it's a really good way to go. Yeah. Yeah. And they don't take a lot of energy. So, and, and they've got the batteries and all mm -hmm. that. So you can, you, you know, I, I don't know that I would be, uh, unless I had a good energy source, I don't know that I'd allow people to be watching movies and stuff like that on them if the if power was an issue. But um, yeah, you know. well, and you know what happens, right? A lot, a lot of people with laptops, what happens to them, right? Oh, well, you know, I I, I outlive the operating, like I couldn't upgrade it anymore. Yeah. You kind of outlive the, you can't do anything with it. Well, you still can, right? That's where you can go load those movie stuff on it. You don't need it to upgrade because you just need it to be right how it is right now that able to show videos and uh get all that electronic stuff that you rely upon all your ebooks and all that and everything that you said like is on dvds and stuff and cds put it on there and you have it you know taken care of yep yep all right so uh, real quick i wanted to go through um and and we've kind of talked about so much right now that we've we may have gone over some of this stuff already but um picking a binder what we have is this exact binder right here. And there's some really more expensive ones, uh, really expensive ones. There's fireproof safes and all, all sorts of different things, depending on your budget and your, your wants and needs. I've got this one because this is, even though they say it's fireproof, it's fire resistant, uh, meaning that it's going to withstand up to a certain temperature. It's got Velcro on the top. You can close it. So unless it's in directly in the line of, in the line of fire, I suppose, um, that stuff that's inside it is going to be more protected than if it's just in a, uh, like a file cabinet or in your desk drawer or something mm -hmm. like that. So I keep all my, my super important stuff in something like this, uh, because it, it is safe. Some people even take something like this and put it inside a fireproof safe. I, I don't know. It is our fireproof safes, uh, way more expensive. I think they're more expensive than no, no, they're not bad. I mean, you can buy like, I mean, if you're just worried about it, because if you just keep it in the bag, you're not worried about getting stolen. You're just worried about the fire aspect of it, right? So yeah. you can buy like, they have those uh, fireproof filing cabinets and stuff. And they're just basically a big block of concrete, right? Shaped up with a lot. The locks aren't that great. Like a bad guy with a screwdriver is going to tear that thing open in a hurry. So if you have like a legit safe, that's anchored down and all that, you know, that has a, has a fire rating on it. That'll help. But I imagine if, if at a minimum, it's, you just really want to protect those papers, get one of those, you can buy them at Walmart, those fireproof boxes, 
um, and throw your and throw your paperwork in there inside that fireproof thing. I think you've ta- I've, you at that point you've done everything you can really do to try to protect your documents. I think that's beyond reasonable. And if yeah um, something happens to them at that point, like hey man, <laughs> yeah. But and and the reason that I think and this is not like a lot of prepper disaster scenarios where this is important that fireproof aspect of it. But when you think about house fires, when you think about maybe earthquakes, uh, tornadoes, just ripping through things, who knows what that damage causes. Uh, so it's just that that extra layer of, of you know, security, especially you got twenty, thirty thousand dollars in cash stacks. You're going to want to put that in a fireproof safe. <laughs> that hey, where's up. your bag? Where do you keep that bag at in your house, dude? What's that? Where do you keep that bag full of stacks at in your house? <laughs> I mean, I'm still working on getting the stacks. <laughs> Oh. I, I, I gotta, I gotta solve that problem before I, before I have to worry about the problem of where to put it all. <laughs> right. Uh, at any rate, I want to go through real quick before we, uh, we're going to have to get out of here. Uh, cause on our, on our recorded live shows, we've only got an hour. Uh, so we can't go our usual hour and however long we go. Uh, but I did want to talk about some of this stuff on here, the, the stuff to include. And a lot of this stuff is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, but it is, you know, important to think about that stuff when you're when you're putting the stuff together and you're not looking at it on a list. You do kind of space some of this stuff out. So it's always good to write the stuff down um, and look at the stuff. And that way, when you're actually putting everything together, uh, you're getting the stuff that you need. But driver's license and ID cards, uh, I, you know, maybe make copies of them, birth certificates, social security cards, passports, marriage certificates, all that that important stuff that you're going to one it it when you when you go to look for something you know exactly where it is so it helps with your organization uh if somebody like when we when the kids lived here and we had all of their security cards cuz i wouldn't uh let them take their social security cards with them cuz they'll end up losing them i knew where they all were and i made sure that when they used it to go get a job or whatever they brought it back to me and i was the keeper of the social security cards same type of principle you know where everything is at when you have it organized like right. this uh, the emergency contact information, um, those phone numbers we were talking about earlier. Nobody, you know, remembers a phone number. So having all of that stuff there, uh, the emergency services, the doctors, veterinarians is an important one, um, especially for us out here because of the horses and all that medical information, vehicle information, just anything you can think of that is that important information that may be useful in you know if everything is just you know like i like i talked about earlier the the earthquakes the the hurricanes the tornadoes all that stuff that stuff that you don't want to have to be searching through a bunch of different things or somebody has to search through a bunch of different things to find out information about you it's all right there uh it's just important to have it's not the fun flashy part of preparedness uh but it's the uh it just makes a lot of sense and i don't care if you're a prepper or not it makes a lot of sense uh for for anybody that's right. Uh huh. <laughs> so we we are going to have to put off the uh, would you turn them away uh, story that I wanted to go through because I do want to dig into that a little bit and we don't have a lot of time to do it on this show. Uh, but I so we're going to put that off until next Sunday. But I think that's a that's a really really good topic. I think because it's one of those where you can debate back and forth and get ideas about it. Uh, but when it comes down to it. Uh, we all, you know, it's not as simple as a lot of people make it out to be like, hey, I'm I'm not letting anybody in. Uh, you know, I'm turning everybody away. Uh, it may not be that simple, you know. Uh, so I think it is something that we at least need to think about and and address a little bit. Um, because if that situation ever does come up, you got to figure out what to do. And I'm not talking about, uh, you know, Uncle Bob that you haven't seen in 15 years. I'm talking about maybe somebody that you've worked with for 10 years that knows where you live, comes over occasionally, but all of a sudden they end up on your front door. What are you going to do then? So mm -hmm. uh, at any rate, do you have any, any closing thoughts or anything on, on anything we talked about today before we get out of here? No, man, I look forward to talking about that next week, man. It'll be a good show. And uh, Hey, everybody have a uh, great rest of Easter. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Be a lot of fun to talk about that. Uh, and yeah, like Brian said, I uh, hope you all had a great Easter and, and it continues to be so even if it's still going on now, but uh uh, with that, uh, we are out of here tonight. Take care and prepare, everyone. We'll talk to you all later.